Gentlemen and ladies, uh, we have convened here today to discuss what I think is the greatest social crisis facing our nation, and we are going to do it now, for the first time ever, a Chapo Symposium on the issue, Is There a Joker Crisis in America? I will be doing uh, the role of McLaughlin on the McLaughlin Group uh, to introduce this you know, all-star cast here. Let's be honest, we're playing with a full deck Jokers are wild, and as such, we've got all aces bringing you this conversation here today. Beginning with, introduce Felix yourself. Felix Biederman. Uh, I consider myself the Pat Buchanan of this roundtable, asking why the Joker has gone to Israel so many times, <laughs> and why those scars are scars from circumcision. I couldn't do the joke visually, Matt. It was a joke before everyone got here, uh, before the McLaughlin group formed. Good joke. Everyone, it was pretty good. I was just disappointed because I didn't get to set it up by calling him the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> But, oh, very but uh, no, I, I think I have a different opinion on this movie than most of the people here. But I think we can all agree on one thing. The music choice, especially for a key scene in the movie. Yet perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely perfect. You're referring to uh, uh, Gary Glitter's. Gary Glitter, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get yeah. to that. Yeah, we'll get okay. to Let's that. Uh, ne- next on the, the panel. Hey, I'm Jen Pan. Um, my qualifications for talking about this movie are that I've seen it. Um, which apparently is more than most people who are writing about it, um, including some articles I saw today in Vogue and The Cut that were titled things like Why I Won't Be Seeing Joker. (laughs) It's important to take a stand. You need to have your voice heard. This is true. Uh, Amber Lee Frost, uh, you know, dedicated soldier in the glorious cause of the workers' movement um, and a PhD in Joker studies. Matt uh, Christman here. Uh, I am reviewing this film, A Changed Man, because of all of the ways I thought I could possibly respond to this movie, I do not think in a million years I could have predicted the way that I actually did. Uh, And we'll talk more about it uh, later. Will Miniker, host, McLaughlin, Chapo Trap House. Uh, Adam can introduce both of us. (laughs) Um, We got Nick uh, from Come Town Podcast, Adam from... Come to the podcast, and I'm I'm glad you guys invited us on to talk about our buddy Shane from the Matt and Shane podcast, <laughs> who's recently fired uh, from SNL. Can you imagine if they tried to put him in that movie? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just like pissed off all the fucking time because <laughs> the fucking Chinese people won't let me say shit that I want to say. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so he uh, obviously he got a raw deal. And uh, so thanks. I mean, we're going to share some thoughts on that. Mm. We're, we're going to get into it. But ke- leading off uh, the symposium, we do have a uh, special guest calling in from Australia, international film critic Matt B. Brady will kick things off with his first thoughts on Joker. Matthew Brady, audio log. I'm recording this in the hopes that there's still someone out there to listen to it. <laughs> I think it's important that at least one person stands witness to these end days. <laughs> I suppose I suppose I should start at the beginning. I can only speak to what happened here in Australia. We lost contact with the rest of the world pretty quickly. On the 4th of October at 10.23am, the Australian Prime Minister ordered every fighter jet the Australian Air Force has into the air. That's right, all eight of them. Their target was simple. Every cinemaplex and movie theatre in the country. The reason? The Joker movie. Unfortunately, the bombs came too late. A few bold souls had tried to warn us beforehand. They told us this movie was dangerous. But we just didn't listen. And even that was an understatement. Joker, directed by Todd Phillips, is like... The Black Death and the Spanish Flu combined. This movie has dropped more bodies than Hillary Clinton. (laughs) Watching it is like staring at the opened Ark of the Covenant. (laughs) Movie theatres just became charnel houses. And the few that managed to survive, you could hardly call them lucky. You see, the movie, it infected them somehow. It was like a virus or something. They'd walk out of the theatre, immediately get online and create a gimmick account like Joker Rates Dogs or (laughs) at Gopnik Joker and just unleash havoc. It's still hard to believe how fast it all happened, how fast the world ended. 
I suppose I should attempt to describe the movie itself. Future generations, if there are any, deserve to know what happened in the before time. You see, I did see the movie. I had to. I managed to find one of the few theatres that didn't get hit. I didn't even need to buy a ticket. There was no one at the register or the concession stand. There was no ushers. I don't even know if there was anyone in the projectionist booth. But that movie, it was playing, so I sat down to watch it. Or I tried to, at least. It was kind of hard to pay attention to the movie itself. I mean, I was constantly having to check the exits or scan the rest of the audience for potential threats. I got up and went to the bathroom seven times and searched it just to make sure no one had hidden a weapon in there, Michael Corleone style. And when I wasn't doing that, I couldn't even sit down. I had to spend the entire movie in a combat crouch with my weight evenly distributed between both feet so that I was ready to launch myself in any direction at the first sign of danger. (sighs) One thing I did notice, though, for a movie called The Joker, it wasn't actually very funny. (laughs) It was pretty light on actual jokes. I feel like the Joker himself could have maybe done a few more bits, you know, like say he had a can of Coke Zero, for instance, and he took a little (laughs) sip and he went, huh, this uh, this Coke Zero, this Coke Zero tastes a little funny. Yeah, I I guess there's a one in it. Yeah. Mad Matt. It really Mad is. Mad Matt now wandering the loam of the outback. A harrowing report from wow. Australia. I couldn't what... understand anything he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> on how the uh, the Joker madness is spreading. But um, uh, we've all now exposed ourselves to it. And uh, I, w- I want to begin this roundtable discussion with uh, Felix. Uh, your article uh, in Deadspin, I think, is a great uh, jumping off point. Uh, could you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about uh, the history of the Joker in American culture, how this Joker fits into our current moment, and some of what you make of the reaction to the movie itself. From there, you you wrote a great review. Nothing in it is wrong, but for, I think we're going to widen of anything that I write. Widen the aperture of this discussion because we have some very uh, some very enthusiastic um, takes on this movie. Well, so the Joker, you know. Joker is a lens you can see certain periods of American history through, like the the uh, Caesar Romero Joker, who I uh, mistakenly referred to as the Oscar Romero Joker <laughs> in the initial draft of the article that somehow went to publication initially. That's uh, actually it was a good comparison because the U.S. military and those death juntas were basically were the Batman of the eighties. Yeah, no, uh, United Fruit Company, Wayne Industries, but. Uh, uh, he he represented a whimsical time where you know we tried to kill Castro with poison dental dams and things like that. Of course, Castro uh, he was part of the anti condom movement, so he was he was safe forever. But uh, you know, in the '90s, you had like an Adbuster style Joker in Jack Nicholson who had no real like nothing really beyond like you know taking an art gallery and making it crazy. And then when we became very self serious and the gritty. Uh, after 9-11 because we had lost a war we had Heath Ledger and uh, now we have the perfect Joker because it creates a for this time because there's a bunch of sound and fury and reaction and counter reaction about this thing that this movie isn't actually about and uh, journalists alternating between telling themselves the same 30 jokes that they've told since uh, like late 2016 uh, against an army of people who are radicalized, not radicalized, but just pay attention to guys on YouTube named like the the snarky logician arguing with each other forever about this thing that's just like it would have just been like a slightly above average movie in 2006. Jen Pan, your thoughts? So um, we, I'm sure we'll talk about all the political stuff and uh, I you know, do want to dive into that, but I think I really like the movie just on the basis of it being kind of like a movie about psychological disintegration, which is like the sort of best movie genre that there is. 
Um, and I mean, I think that, you know, one particular part in that, in the movie where that comes through is kind of when there's that sort of reveal near the end where it turns out that he's kind of hallucinated this relationship with his neighbor who lives down the hall. And that was sort of the, you know, point that people I think got a little upset or uncomfortable about. They were like, this is the kind of like incel part or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I really didn't think it was like a condemnation of her. He didn't seem to be particularly angry at her. She seemed like a good mom and a good neighbor. Um, and, but, you know, there was that kind of reveal where it was like, oh, he is completely batshit. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool, even if that kind of moment was a little bit fight clubby or, you know, a bit, um, I don't know, a bit tired at this point. And uh, we, I, I, we, there's promises that we'll talk about Gary Glitter, so I'll, I'll hold off on that, but that's like... Not guilty. Yeah, we'll... <laughs> <laughs> we need a Tariq Nasheed thread on Gary Glitter. <laughs> Amber. Okay, so I actually went into this like knowing that it was going to be like a series of homages, and I, I had like a major like criticism. It would be that it was like a little too packed with homages, but I thought that actually in many ways it was the inverse of like a like a, a death wish or, um, you know, a taxi driver because those are um, movies uh, that are high art and highly reactionary. And this is a movie that's not really high art, but it has perfect politics. It is a class war movie, but the kind of like liberal punditry class wouldn't know class war if it bit them in the ass. Like, like they would watch like, you know, the execution of the Romanovs and be like, mm, racism much? Like, it's actually insane. And I think the most interesting thing about the movie is that, like, it has proven that, like, the Trump administration has turned every, like, liberal into, like, a 1970s Wisconsin housewife just like listening to her son's heavy metal records backwards looking for secret satanic messages. It's completely insane. I think it's amazing watching this about the Central Park Five minutes about incels. And when it's just so clearly about class war, if anything, this movie has exposed the psychosis of the kind of like, you know, cultural media liberal. And it's not even like subtly about that. There are points in the That's movie. That's the biggest complaint <laughs> is that it's like, too on the nose there, about class war. There are points in the movie where you just see like newspaper headlines that just say "kill the rich." Uh, we'll get to that. But uh, next up, Matt Christman. All right, I went into this movie expecting myself to have basically Felix's opinion of all of this ridiculous mess and cultural mishigash over this. What a perfectly emblematic Michigas. moment we have this garbage and, and just this stupid sterile argumentation about garbage. That's so perfect, and that's what I was expecting to think. And I was, of course, also resentful of just the idea that now every film has to just be a, a superhero movie for it to get funding. So you just make good movies and turn them into superhero garbage. But I sat down to watch it, and I now believe that it is, I think, honestly, almost accidentally, and not really through an effort of any of the filmmakers, just lightning in a bottle, a work of surpassing brilliance and a masterpiece. <laughs> I think it is genius. I think it is brilliant. Michael Moore agrees with you. I think that there are two levels of analysis here that are incredibly sharp and illuminating and like felt made me like feel like I had taken an intellectual fucking uh, enema. They just like made so many things that felt kind of right outside the tip of my tongue to f make sense. Like it, it just by, by exemplifying two phenomena. One is it distillates the last 20 years of cultural conversation about what the Joker means as a cultural character, right? Because the Joker's been around forever, but only since, like, Dark Knight, uh, the Joker's become a, a focal point in culture. He's a shibboleth for white male alienation, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, the twisted idea. The idea, you know, why should I ap apologize for the monster I've become? Nobody apologized for making me one, right? That's what the Joker represents. And this movie is about how that, what that means. It has to be a movie about the Joker. It has to be a Joker origin story because it's the origin of the Joker, not as a character in the Marvel DC universe, but as a cultural phenomenon, what the Joker comes from. And, and then on the, level, on, on the level of the text itself, you have the, pro the whole movie is about the process wh whereby cultural, capitalist cultural hegemony takes white male alienation and directs it away from class consciousness towards individual nihilism. Mm. And that is the process of the movie. That is, the movie is his class alienation that all people feel political. being directed by culture 
down to this nihilistic path and away from a real revolutionary spirit. And that's why it had to be a, 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 a 70s um, period piece because that is when, because the Joker now is a gritty character. Like, that's the whole joke is that it's comic book stuff, but he's serious. And the 70s is when we invented gritty cinema. It was the first New Hollywood 70s is when gritty cinema existed. And it has to be a superhero movie because that's the current coin of the cultural realm. And it's like people who grow up with these cultural references and experience class-based uh, alienation are then channeled because of the culture that they consume towards nihilism and away from class consciousness. And the dream at the end where he gets held up, spoiler alert, and embraced that isn't real is that like the thing that could actually be good, the, 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 the suppressed desire for community and solidarity. And then he snaps back to being literally in the asylum and separated and unable to connect to others and committed to a life of meaningless violence. And then you have the fact that the liberals decided to tell people this movie is too scary. It's too bad. You're all going to become sh incel shooters if you see it. Don't Deranged. see it. So, of course, all these guys go and see it right. because that's enticing. And now they can't analyze it about class consciousness because they've already been told it's actually about how you're an entitled white male who wants to be a ra in charge and you hate women and minorities. And then you see the movie and you're like, well, I relate it's to a lot of this. It's but also I not guess, what it's about, obviously. I guess it's about being a Nazi and I'm a Nazi now because they're, they're brainwashing. They're literally washing it and poisoning it in per, uh, by saying that shit mm -hmm. and they hope you'll take that message away okay, from Matt, you've been talking they for an hour i'm sorry i'm done like i said <laughs> i'm just going to say a few things and that was one of them i probably won't talk again for like 20 minutes <laughs> that's not true <laughs> nick oh yeah i just thought it was tight I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so i mean I, yeah i guess everybody projects their own i mean literally everybody projects everything they're feeling onto mm -hmm. this fucking movie for some reason but the only important thing to me was that Todd Phillips could make a funny movie when he needed to. And the moments that are supposed to be funny in that movie are fucking hilarious. So, I mean, that alone did it for me. Other than that, yeah, it's a great performance. Fucking fun Best to watch. Best actor in the yeah, world. Yeah, it's just, it was, I, it was fun. It's a fucking yeah. fun movie. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you go see that movie and you don't walk away, like, not feeling like you had a good time. Adam. Um... I think I guess I depart from what everyone's been saying. I think the movie was about anti-Semitism. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people scoff at us because we're failed stand-up comedians and we bathe our mothers and <laughs> we get into bed with our mothers and watch late night television with them. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, one day we could, we could maybe snap. You know, <laughs> one day we could maybe like, uh, you know, kill the president or something like that, you know? So I think well, no, I mean I, th I I agree, dude. You guys are way smarter well, than me. I guess I guess spoiler alert: the movie does culminate with. Uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about like you know Joaquin Phoenix's Arthur Fleck, his take on the Joker. Felix, you described how uh, a, a previous incantations of the Joker have fit into uh, American culture. Uh, two questions: A, where does Jared Leto Joker fit into your equation, and where does Joaquin Phoenix Arthur Fleck Joker? Well, Jared Leto was perfect for like the pre-Trump uh, hyper consumer of media period because it was like this fucking idiot doing something stupid and then people running it into the ground and this thing becoming financially viable despite what, you know, a few odd hundred thousand people who consume every bit of media said. So it, it was the perfect pre-Trump thing. Uh, but this one, like, just in and of itself, like, removed from what I think of the movie as a whole, he does, like... Joaquin Phoenix is he's the greatest. He's great he's, he, he does a fucking amazing job playing a deeply disturbed, like sort of sympathetic, isolated oh. man. Yeah, no, he's he's twisted as fuck. But also, he, just amazing dancer. I have to say, yeah. like, I know there were like five like weird, I like, it was interpretive great. dance scenes, yeah. but he's like clearly taken some Martha Graham classes. Absolutely, he's got loose hips. He's wonderful. Yeah, he's yeah. in his body. I will. And then get, he, the fact that he gave himself computer neck for the movie, <laughs> yes, to appeal to the when there's no reason he doesn't work at a desk. There's no reason for his posture to look like that. Right. He looked like the Hanway and boxing kid. Like it's fucking amazing. I he's 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 the king. Jen, like uh. As Phil was alluding to, like Joaquin Phoenix, his his portrayal of the Joker, Arthur Fleck, uh, a struggling comedian. But to me, what the movie was really about is a guy, a fairly harrowing and affecting because of Joaquin Phoenix's performance, portrayal of a guy suffering from mental illness and the lack of social resources to help him or his family. Like, do you think that like it, the portrayal of uh, like sort of civil service and social good in the movie? 
says that it's like it's a lack of that that's killing Arthur, or is it like are they as indifferent as the Thomas Wayne, you know, sort of charitable billionaire character? Yeah, I mean, you know, as Amber said, like I too thought that the movie had perfect politics, such that when we walked out of the theater, we went to see it together, and when we walked out, I said, "I'm going to call the movie Woker." <laughs> um, I mean, I think that you know. Obviously, like, he is psychologically disintegrating and the backdrop is, you know, one of extreme economic inequality, um, the retrenchment of the welfare state, uh, and, you know, labor unrest. Mm. Um, did everybody catch that whole, like, garbage strike? Right, the yeah, garbage like, strike. Also, which also means like, that the trash is piling up. Yeah, also he was, like, literally chained to a radiator and beaten into brain right. damage yeah. as a child. Yeah, yeah, like, he had a lot of shit going on. Um, but I also think about that part in the movie where he is talking to his social worker and at first, it, he, you know, he's kind of like, oh, you're not listening to me and it sort of seems like she's not that invested. Um, but then she's like, the money is gone. They don't give a shit about you, but they also don't give a shit about me. So, you know, I think that um, overall, his kind of like own turmoil was very, very much set in this, you know, larger context of societal disintegration um, and... I mean, I have more to say about just like American mainstream American movies and class conflict, uh, but you know, let's we'll come back. Yeah, I think that that element of uh, of him of him being alienated from the social welfare state, but then at the end, the thing about that we don't have any money. It's 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 very perceptive about failed and how intentionally because the idea is. These aren't these institutions aren't alienating them themselves. They are they are hollowed out by the like neoliberal state. Totally, like they are intentionally deprived of resources so right. that they don't function. And but what the function of that is is that someone who interacts with those institutions in a way that is alienating is then alienated from the state as a concept, and it further atomizes them and takes their rage and makes it more personal and makes them hard. It makes it harder for them to see things as like the product of you know capitalism. So I thought like also like. It was the thing that annoyed me is that like I realized like oh this is a we live in a society movie and I don't like that they're using comic books to tell like Ken Loach stories but nonetheless I will say that I do think everyone who is not like the wealthy people there are portrayed relatively like sympathetically um, or at least like opaquely enough to leave room like really the only true enemies in it are one, like, Wall Street guys, and two, like, these lofty, allegedly benevolent, liberal, you know, billionaires. Yeah. And, like, I thought that was pretty good. I thought, like, even, like, you know, the kids that knocked him around, like, later on, he was just like, yeah, I shouldn't have chased them. It's also he, his uh, Jewish co-worker yeah. who plants the gun on him <laughs> yeah. and causes all the problems. I don't know if no, it was that a was Jew. A dwarf like, but, yeah. No, no, the dwarf didn't give him the gun. No, it no. the it Jewish was man. I thought it was weird when uh, Phoenix looked directly into the camera and told the viewer to Google the USS Liberty. <laughs> 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 okay, so, like, I, I agree with what you guys saying about, like, the politics of the movie, but I, that's still, like, <laughs> it doesn't make, like, the actual m movie that great for me. Like well, it's, it's really heavy handed because it's a fucking comic book. Right, movie. exactly. Yeah. It's it's like and that's to, like yeah, what is if you, upsetting. If you zoom like, way into it and just look at it as like this is a stupid movie about the Joker, it's fucking great about a clown it's a fucking, that's mad at Batman. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's, it's, the only it's, thing it's, Todd Phillips said about the movie. Standards, I completely the only agree. thing Todd Phillips said about the movie is like, yeah, you can't really make jokes anymore. And that's it. That, I haven't heard like him way like wade into these conversations at all. And that's like what I've heard from the filmmakers. I and think he said at one point he's like, you know, you're not like he's like he's not like a hero. He's just like a subject. It, and the, I feel like people don't understand. The people that who made the movie, everyone's yeah, baby don't brain give now. A shit about yeah. this. Every, everybody, everybody who's in a movie has to be a good guy that you root for because then yeah. it teaches you good lessons and how to be a good person because well, you have the brain. Everything that got bad with Breaking Bad is where that fucking started. The final season of Breaking Bad, people are like, what? Shouldn't he be in jail? Yeah. And you're like what? <laughs> no, it's Hayes Code <laughs> idiocy. Right. That's yeah. that's. A level the third level of analysis that this is all very depressing because we're having these in-depth meditations my, myself included i need that 300 dollars from deadspin for more gaming mouses <laughs> but uh about this thing that like I, it's an impossible thing to verify right but if you took this movie removed the joker from it removed the context that we're in from it put it in fucking 2007 where we all watch it how would you feel about it i right. don't know and it's depressing because yeah not only is this movie beat you over the head, very un unsubtle to the point where we're unsure of like when we delve deeper into it, we're unsure of how good it actually is. 
the main criticism from it is adults who seem to have had some sort of like brain degeneration where just every piece of media has to be about friends being nice to each other. Protagonist like means Dick good guy. Protagonist means you like them. Protagonist means you are them. Mm. It's psychotic and well, sucks. Well, did I, anyone see the Florida Project? Yeah, that was just poverty porn, though. No, it's. I think it's the yeah, most. Yeah. I think it's the most beautiful movie about the American working class that I've no, seen. No, that long and time. American Honey were both. Yeah, like, well, look at you're these both middle class cunts, so I'm gonna like fight back. But on no, this. but who was that it movie is a made beautiful by? Beautiful movie, and it is something about who who and made that movie. Uh, the the guy bourgeois that, that people made. for sure. Yeah, but bourgeois people do make good right. art. But Nonetheless, that's it, that's it. it is like I don't even know what that word is. Is this another yet. Joker movie? <laughs> yes, Florida in many Joker. ways. It is. So it there's a there's a protagonist in it that is like a Joker. shitty person who's like a very shitty person, uh, and it's like you don't feel like compelled to say, oh, this is a good person or this is a bad person, specifically because it doesn't carry with it the baggage of the Joker. It's that people aren't looking at it being like, oh, is this supposed to represent like Pepe or something? Right. Like people can watch that. And this is also a terrible person and still like feel sympathy and feelings for them. And and it's just like literally people are become it's like Hillary being obsessed with Pepe. Like they've lost their fucking mm-hmm. minds. See, but that's just the thing. And that's why I must fixate in my extolling of this film is that the level that it is most powerful for me at and the one that I think justifies everything that I think you might have a narrow point about in terms of why has it got to be a Joker movie, uh, uh, all this dumb stuff, and and how it's obvious it hit you over the head. In my opinion, all those things connect to to raise the movie to its highest level, which is where it it is a movie about how the Joker started, but not the character in the fucking comics, the phenomenon of because he represents alienated white era. male pathology yeah. right mm-hmm. that is what the joker is that's the guys who wear it they embrace that idea and the liberal uh, scolds who are terrified of white men since trump that's where they that's what they think it is too mm-hmm. and this movie is about how that came into being the process of alienation and then fragmentation that turns someone and makes them identify with that instead of something more broad, well, the worst, something more yeah. pathological. The, and the, that's where the movie, I think, shines. The most dangerous example of that is James Holmes or whatever. And then that's like a, a, this like Berenstein Bears thing that mm-hmm. people yeah. look back yeah. on and think that it had more weight than it did. And it's like, yeah, again, it's like... His, it's you know, it's funny in the movie where Joker says, "No, I don't believe in any. I don't fucking pay." Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. it's I don't love that. Shit. And James wrote Holmes something is similarly, about it. it's like you know, he's just somebody that's severely fucking mentally ill. And Someone, it's already been written about multiple people. times. Yeah. It's like the myth that won't die that he was inspired by this movie, but it's also like, but dude, people got shot up at a fucking Ariana Grande concert, or mm-hmm. like you know, what was the Stephen Paddock thing? Like Jason Aldean. Jason Aldean. Yeah, Jason Aldean. Yeah. Like it's completely. Deranged. It's literally because people just kind of fear these alienated young men and the things that they like. Well, well I think I think it's also like it is. I talked about this a bit in the review. It's and this is obviously like a, a pre-Trump phenomenon. And it is annoying to put everything through his lens, but I, I it's because this has been going on since the eighties and before that, where people feel they have lost all power politically, and the one place where you feel like consuming everything and reacting to everything does produce some effect is doing that with the culture. Vulgar Gramscianism. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. It's all yeah. entirely outsourced. Nobody experiences anything internally anymore. Every, you, right. both, you, you consume it and react to it immediately in real time externally. And they expect it to reflect it, like morals that are also but sourced that's, externally. But also, like, we've yet to, like, like, I don't know how we drive home to, like, these insane, paranoid, like, liberals and conservatives that, like, that's not how art works. Like, it's gone past Gramscianism, and it's moved into, like, basically superstition and augury. Like, no Comptown listener has actually had sex with their dad. I'm sorry. I'm going to go out on a limb and know. say that. Yeah, I mean, I have evidence to the You're not a listener. <laughs> no, oh. but, like, th- this is, like, the thing. Like, the idea that they think that a movie is, like, or any kind of art is some kind of, like, spell that, like, directs people's actions that's not how fucking art works well, it's, it's it's oh sorry no, go ahead. it's like it's the easiest form of like criticism of art is to just like try to identify either theory or morals and line it up with like a checklist mm. and mm-hmm. it's like a shortcut to actually thinking about anything because it's much harder to describe what your feelings are to have some to react to a piece of art and explain this is how it made me feel 
rather than these are the rules it followed or did not follow. But it's gotten worse since Trump, right? Like every piece of like film I, I don't criticism know has turned yeah. into a goofus and gallant comic. I think strip. it's I think it's I think it's it's <laughs> the, the evolution of like media where you know you could you point to a lot of things. I think a, a lot of it too is you have plenty of people that have like a uh, post high school uh, education now and then they work at fucking like Radio Shack. So they have mm. nothing to do but like continue doing homework online. Mm. So they'll go see the Joker movie and they're like, well, I guess this has to be worth more than the $20 I spent on it. Let me like write a screed about why the Joker's a bad yeah, guy. Yeah, there's an economic incentive certainly to like see fucking like shadows and like see monsters. Yeah, yeah they give your life more worth than it has. I don't, right, I don't even, but yeah, I don't even think it's like, it's like what Nick says, it's not even necessarily economic. It is like, the two things that give your life that make you keep you from killing yourself are novelty and meaning. Mm. This is false meaning. There's no novelty left. There is a project, and I honestly don't know how conscious it is, but the outcome of this project at the elite media level of condemning the Joker and people who like it is psychos. The the, the end result of this, regardless of whatever the the conscious intent of it is, the end result of this is to take is to brand white male alienation as re- re- pathological and reactionary inherently. Mm-hmm. And that is why you condemn the Joker movie. And then, the, But the real result of that is, of course, the people you're talking about, they're not going to be warned away from it. They're going to be intrigued by it. And when they encounter it, they're going to encounter it on the terms you've created that say that it's pathological, and they're going to then be reinforced in the idea that, oh, yeah, the problem isn't economic. It's, it's all the things you want it to be about because then you have annihilated the possibility of solidarity. We can't have solidarity with all these white males. Oh, they're, they're racist and they're sexist. Meanwhile, they could easily be appealed to on the root basis of their alienation. Mm-hmm. But no, you're poisoning the well for everybody else with these evil men. And that's, that's the actual end result of all of this demonizing the Joker. It is to reinforce this persistent cultural hege- hegemonic uh, agenda it's a strategy it's a it's a it's a rhetorical strategy for uh, for disallowing solidarity i i don't know if i i think for like a lot of the people that just react to it i don't know if it's a conscious strategy but the effect certainly is like taking people who would otherwise not give a shit about this and making them identify with it if you just point at something and say this is bad this is dangerous this is going to make you specifically kill me specifically (laughs) Mm -hmm. What the fuck do you think is going to happen? Evidence of that being, uh, this movie has now obliterated most box office records for an October release. Well, also, Paul Klaus for an R-rated movie. Eileen Jones's... The Suicide Squad Joker is interesting to look at because, like, I remember thinking Suicide Squad was coming out in, like, 2001 because I feel like that's when the coverage of that movie began. It was, like, every two weeks, sort of, like... Fucking, you know, uh, Jared Leto took a dump in Will Smith's <laughs> yeah. sleeping bag. You know, and like every single fucking month, there was like a Hollywood Reporter or Vanity Fair article or something oh, the other about side, his fucking yeah. antics. He had the, he sent them used condoms. Yeah, used condoms. He put a bullet in his mailbox. All this dumb bullshit. And I didn't even I didn't even end up seeing Suicide Squad, but I know we got like cut down to like ten minutes or whatever. Going back, but what's it, important uh, about yeah, that? You ha- I mean, well, I'm just saying, like, if you. Look at the because you, you, you look at the media run up to this Joker coming out. You think, well, how much of this is contravenes? How much control do they actually have over the way people are talking about this movie? And you say, like, okay, is all, all this outrage, is that like manufactured? Is it possible for I them to so. do that? And it's like, well, if you look at Suicide Squad, they tried to do that. They tried to do, they tried to like get people like, what? Wow, this, this is going to be such a fucking they, twist. They tried to do that with Lady Ghostbusters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but the thing about uh, uh, about uh, the Same general it. Leto Joker is the reason they couldn't get it to catch fire and get people to really panic is because Trump hadn't won yet. Yeah, it was it's it's Trump that made it's the Trump context for the syndrome. current Joker. Yeah, because yeah. Joe the Trump winning is what sent everyone to a panic because they lost all control of the government, all that. But they have the readouts of culture and they're going to use them. Mm-hmm. They're going to use culture as just a vulgar brick mm-hmm. to hit you in the head until you become one of them. Yeah, and one of the ways they're going to do that is by demonizing anything that they think is an expression of this awful male patriarchal identity that led to Trump winning because gamer gators are why Trump won because the Pepe's are the ones who made Trump win, which is absurd. Mm -hmm. He won because Hillary Clinton was a terrible candidate. He got less votes than Mitt Romney. It was purely a depression of Democratic turnout because of the awful Clinton campaign. That is the only reason he won. But now, because the only explanations are cultural, uh, it's got to be this awful trend and these Mm -hmm. awful men. 
And so that's why the Joker now is a problem. And when he was a joke, when Leto was doing that stuff. And on yeah. another level, it well, was Leto's just, also a, a shittier actor. Yeah, he's, which, I mean, he has an Oscar, which is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. mostly good at dying. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it's like they, they, you know, I mean, it was a very much like trying to be into like a hot topic. But, you know, it's I, like ironically, the actual like fucking poor people that probably would have more in common with that character have the same tastes as the Suicide Squad. Absolutely. Joker. They're, they're like, yeah, I want Mountain Dew Joker. You know, they don't want... Yeah, uh, I want him when he's like a metal fucking gritty, Joker. Gritty I like, I like the one where he's like an Instagram like, um, mm. cartel guy, yeah. which apparently was the Leto inspiration, mm. was Instagram cartel guys with like engraved pistols and shit, like lame suits. Yeah. yeah. Also, it was just a way for a studio to make a superhero movie for mm. $60 million, it, it, which yeah, is yeah, like yeah, unheard yeah. of. And as, like now all these movies cost like two hundred million dollars and they're breaking box office records based off of this panic that's like associated it, it, with yeah. Trump. It, it's like it's two, a perfect storm in terms of like the motivations of the character. There's like there's very little in terms of like literal exposition in the in the film, with the exception of that one scene before he kills Robert De Niro or whatever. And I love- it just boils down to something about like jokes are subjective and so are morals. <laughs> and that's the whole point. That's all they like really give you. Uh, well, let's talk about the film itself. Um, you know, it, it really focuses on Joaquin Phoenix as Arthur Fleck. The like his portrayal of Joker. The first thing we see of him is he is like a sort of street sign clown and sort of carnival barker on what is a clearly a stand in for CD 42nd Street. Uh, dressing up like a clown for, you know, at rented being at rented out to advertising purposes. Mm-hmm. Sort of a subway Jared type. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Is that you know, a segue to Gary Glitter? <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he lives at home with his mom. He uh, dotes on her and takes yeah. care care of her. She's not quite all there. Yeah, um, and you know he has aspirations to uh, you know have a, a stand up comedy career and generally be noticed by people. And like uh, the sort of the dawning of his Joker personality is about like uh, coming out of his complete and total social isolation as someone basically the person on the bus that makes you uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, Jen, like, how did, how did you feel about the uh, development of, of uh, Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal of this character and as it relates to the politics in the movie? Um, I mean, I don't know. I think that, well, okay, m- maybe I'm skipping a little ahead to Gary Glitter, but I feel like maybe it's time <laughs> it's, it's since time. we're talking it's about time. the content of the movie. So I, I thought that scene was awesome where he has basically, it's sort of the um, analog of like Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver showing up at the political rally with like his head with like his new mohawk, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So like he's basically everyone loves Warren a makeover book. scene. Everybody, oh my god, it was totally everyone a makeover scene. <laughs> everyone loves a makeover scene. He like puts on his face paint, um, kills a few people, including his mom. Spoiler, sorry. Um, and then is dancing on the steps to Gary Glitter. Um, and I, you know, was I was in a Cambodian prison for pedophilia. Yeah. Does everybody know who Gary Glitter is, by the way? Or like, hey, but this uh, was the weird thing. A lot of pedophile. people didn't know. Right. So just as like, just as like a little refresher. So Gary Glitter was this like British glam rocker in the seventies, and in the nineties, he was convicted in the UK for possessing child pornography. Went to jail for a few years got out, like, immediately went to Southeast Asia and began molesting children. <laughs> Twisted. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, what I found out today is he actually served his time there, got out, went to the UK, but he's in jail again because he was, like, immediately convicted of multiple lost. rapes. What for? Yeah, he's like... Oh, you surprised no, me. No, no, in 2015. In 2015, <laughs> he was convicted again of, like, multiple rapes, so he's in jail in the UK now. So, I mean, oh, what, for the, be- yeah, for the yeah. best. You know? Of I mean, course, like, yeah. I'm not, he clearly can't keep his hands off Yeah. It's... Um, so like, so the film critic, Anthony Lane in the New Yorker, and like, I also read an article in the cut talking about the kind of like dancing to Gary Glitter scene. And, um, both reviews were sort of like scandalized, like, oh, we can't be giving royalties to a pedophile. Like this movie clearly did this to every movie made by Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) The famously anti-pedophile Hollywood movie system. But I mean, what struck me about that scene is it's obviously a moment of such dysfunction that, of course, they had to use a jock jam by a pedophile who's in Thai jail. Yeah. Right. And they left it. It's like I feel almost deliberately left out of the trailer. That's not the music that it's paired totally. with in the trailer. And it gives you a much different idea of what's happening in that scene when you see the trailer versus the actual film. Well, and like like. On top of that, like I was sort of shocked by like how many people were like, did you know who Gary Glitter was? And it's like, 
Yeah, he's How gross. do you not know about this? So- like, honestly, yeah. it seems like the media class, like, you have to be so simultaneously unpunk and unjock to oh, have yeah, not totally. been exposed as a... Yeah, one like, of the articles mm, I read was like... You've never been to, like, a single stadium? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the articles I read was like, "This song has been plucked from musical obscurity," and it's like, "Oh the musical my god!" Every, every sporting event ever, nerd are you? every sporting event in America ever, right. even after it was revealed he was a pedophile. No, they, they played it more. Was it tight. rock and roll number <laughs> two? Yeah. yeah, is the name of the song. Yeah, yeah. it is it's a like, jam. It is like <laughs> a jock jam. I, I was <laughs> I was talking about this with somebody today, where it was like, it like they had to they like whoever picked it like. I don't know everything about how movies are made, but I assume things go through multiple layers. Like, you don't? There's no, like, back line for people well, like Well, I assume, you like, there's a guy who's fucking awesome at imagining things, <laughs> and they just go from there. But, like, do you they think have it was... a music supervisor, a guy right, that picks right. the songs, yeah. So do you think this was deliberate? Like, they were deliberate. I think they had to know. Like, Todd Phillips like, also, probably like, thought it was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. There's a good chance that there's... Yeah, it's funny. But there's also a good chance that, like, a... a not insignificant number of people in that decision making room were just like, oh yeah, tight. Yeah, totally. Okay, I mean, yeah. like, like I said, people in are stupid. Can we say like a just a? I don't know if this is knocking things off course, but a brief anecdote was that there was a lady sitting in front of us, and Matt was laughing the entire movie, including the scene where he kills his mother. And it's a hilarious movie. The yeah. lady, it really picks its spots, but when it does do a joke, it lands. That's what that's what was so great about it for me is that, that fucking that scene where he does the joke and that woman. I guess she's supposed to be Doctor Doctor Ruth. Ruth yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's like, that's not funny to have like this old woman who talks about her pussy on TV. He tells him what he, goes, he can't say. He's reading out of his joke note. He goes, knock, knock. Who's there? It's the police. Your wife just died. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, your son just died in a drunk driving accident. Yeah. Yeah, which is like, which is funny because like you could you could have fucking Zach Alphanakis do that bit. And it's like, you know, it's like Norm MacDonald anti-comedy. It's fucking hilarious. And then that like quick cut to just the two shot of like, you can't joke about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Bo- and Bobby's right like, you that's know, not that's funny. Not There's funny. certain things you can't yeah. joke about. It's very, it's like a fucking hilarious. It's very he's good. a very good like comedy director. And the, the, very few people have like the ability to edit a shot. This like movie that. was funnier than Hangover 3 by far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure, that uh, my mom just died. I'm celebrating. I mean, there's, there's so, so many, funny. like just really fucking deeply funny moments. Anyway, Matt movie. was peeing his pants the whole movie, and then a lady in front of us would just kept turning around and looking at him. To be fair, I would be worried if based you were on the profile. Up. Yeah, based on the profile, yeah. she was like, "Oh, is it one of those guys?" Yeah. Sorry, lady, <laughs> I'm twisted. That's all there is to it. It's You're just gonna my have to deal with it. Friend, man. Uh, and, uh, the fir- uh, and first three rows, like, like if the guy that looked like Matt was Cape Fear hysterically laughing. <laughs> he was the whole movie. movie theater. Yeah. I might be worried, even if it was like a Pixar. There movie. There were multiple. There were multiple black women at the movie theater seeing the movie by themselves. Oh yeah, no. So like, we should talk about the. The theater experience. Well, we saw it at uh, Alamo Draft House, you know, our, <laughs> our favorite uh, film experience. It's so yeah, awesome. you, 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 guys, you, guys, you guys with Alamo are fucking the Trump Diet Coke. You guys, me. really, we got to stop. There's no, I honestly, awful. this is one thing I actually agree with the audience on. They absolutely hate it when we complain about the Alamo Draft House. Well, <laughs> yeah, and I, I understand. First of all, why do you listen to the audience? I know I it's shouldn't, but move. it's one thing I agree with them on. Okay, we all, we all acknowledge it's it. It's an awful fucking theater. But, so we were but you friends. guys see every movie there. It's insane. I know. It's, it's fucking insane. Like my treats, okay? To be <laughs> fair, the Fandango app doesn't airline. work with the Regal and Union Square. Okay. And really? I've gotten bed bugs there numerous yeah, Nick times. Yeah, And ringworm. There. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. We got ringworm. Oh, that's what? I mean, it Union could be Square my fault. Regal. I don't want to put it entirely yeah, on Yeah, it's probably your <laughs> poor life choices and living in a windowless tenement in Chinatown. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the, you're like, it must have been the movie. Let's put it this way. I had bed bugs, and I used to go there all the time. So, you should well, be careful going to that night, theater. Or opening day for the 420 showing, literally. Hell okay. yeah. Uh, we were frisked. Yeah. There was like a security so apparatus at the door. Our bags were searched, I was and saying, they ran the metal detector over me. I want to get like full Muslim outfit, you know, full garb, and go to one of the theaters that's searching people and be like, why, because I'm Muslim? <laughs> Is that it why? Was like, Is that why you're searching me at the Joker movie? <laughs> They're like, it no, it's like the other one. Actually deranged. And then we got in and like the theater, it was an Alamo Draft House, like 420 showing. It was like half, it was mostly like women that just want to drink a watered down Aperol mm-hmm. spritz in the dark. I saw I saw it in Williamsburg. I didn't get frisked. And it's like Was there like a security like line search. with like metal detectors and stuff? And metals like So that was no. just like a special Alamo thing, I guess. Yeah. They're giant babies. Again, they suck. 
Okay, mm-hmm. we started the album on Monday, and because we had like a ton of people on this episode, Chris was like, if you have any extra XLR cables, bring it to the theater. And I did, but I brought it in this like uh, sort of perfectly rectangular leather pouch. Mm-hmm. And it's actually a shout out to Jack Wagner. It was the thing you left at uh, my house when you came over to record. And I brought it to the theater, and I, it was not checked, but it, I swear to God, it looked like the perfect case for a well, that, also, that, that's look how, that's how yeah. look at you well that's how will would do a mass shooting he would take like a he would take like a, a luger that he got from his grandfather's <laughs> estate out of a nice leather case yeah it wouldn't be just some vulgar ar-15 no, 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 he would be like, i would have like a bespoke like leather satchel <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay so arthur fleck uh it, it's a movie is portrayal of his yeah me, like you know mental disintegration but it really does, you know, grind down um, uh, his shitty day to day existence and like the, the the catalyst for all of the the horrible things that happen in the movie and the streak of you know murders that he does is both him being given a gun by his coworker and eventually losing his job and access to uh, social welfare. by his more reactionary coworker. Yes, because when he got like beat up by kids, he's like, oh, they're just kids. And then his coworker actually like coerced him. And we've already established that he was on like seven medications. And then eventually he, because of the social services got cut, he didn't get them anymore. Yeah, he's also the only other coworker that's not marginalized in any way other than by being bald. But yeah, that's this is so like, where do you have to what? How did he end up there? His his condition well, uh, yeah. is material, and it's like yeah. and the culture buffets him in one direction. It well, gives him a, the idea of a power fantasy with a firearm instead sure. of solidarity, and it gives him like someone to blame. Uh, without it, it like sh- it pushes him in that uh, yeah. direction. I'm just adding that as like uh, something else to throw in the pile as arguments against any commentary that the movie is like reactionary in any way with regards to race because. I don't know. You said that that somebody was saying that it's like the Central Park Five was well, real. The opening scene. No, of the I, movie. I don't those think that at all. Not, they're like fucking. Also, like, they're a Italian mixed race kids. gang of like Italians and yeah, Puerto Ricans. Yeah, they were very multiracial. Yeah, it's also, yeah. yeah it was the colors of Benetton gang. Yeah. Like, moreover, like I'm sorry, but the focal point of the Central Park Five was a rape in a park. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was a like, rape of a rich white lady. Yeah, like this had nothing to do with that. Right. These it people wasn't were just deranged. Exactly. Well, the, the opening scene of the movie is him, you know, out on the street hawking his sign. And then, like, yeah, a gang of teenagers steals his sign, runs away. He chases after them because, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to get his pay docked if he loses the mm-hmm. sign of the store that he's doing his clown chilling for. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they run down an alley. The, pe- the teens uh, hit him with the sign and beat the shit out of him in an alley. And then it's like, you know, uh, you know, title credit Joker over the screen is like the, the first scene is of him being, you know, beaten and humiliated in the street by a group of uh, rowdy teens. But the real, like the the real violent turn in the movie is after losing his job and having this gun, he uh, murders three sort of like uh, they're they're coded as like Wall Street stock bros, but it's later revealed that they work for uh, Wayne Industries, and they're frat bros, and he does they're like drunk sort of, and they assault him. After yeah, they're, what is Wayne them. Industries? Does that is there what is that? Oh, okay. it's, yeah, they yeah. Do. manufacture it's, items. Yeah, yeah, it's part of the business. Industry. It's, it's like, one of those things where it's anything. Yeah, yeah, no, in the in the Batman universe, Wayne Industries just seems like they produce smokestacks. Like that's right. their main export. And you know, and, and also the pollution factories and the racism factories. Yeah. Also, in this movie, Thomas Wayne is running for mayor, and we see him as sort of a uh, fake philanthropic uh, Michael Bloomberg style. Uh, self-styled benevolent billionaire. He's the only one that can save Gotham. And there's even a moment on TV where he goes on the news uh, responding to the uh, Arthur's murder of these three uh, finance guys on the subway that, you know, that there's like an anti-rich attitude and people who are jealous of success are, you know, striking out at their betters. They're basically. clowns. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it's important to point out that uh, Thomas Wayne, because we say, what does Wayne Industries do? It's always very, very vague. But, and it's often just what's convenient for the plot. It's convenient. It's what's convenient for the plot. But I think that the modern understanding, if you ask somebody, what do you in your head think that Wayne Industries does? It is definitely a manufacturer or something. Right. It's not like a brand or like pharmaceutical company or something. It's a manufacturer, which means that there is zero chance that around the time of this movie is exactly when Wayne Industries Industries starts massively relocating their facilities out of the United States. Mm. Like they are in the process of moving to Mexico and then later China. Yeah. All of that shit is being done 
uh, uh, in in foreign countries. It would be cool if they stayed in this universe and did another like 1981 period piece for Bane, but he's an Italian bodybuilder from Bensonhurst. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his dad's he like greasing him up him. before his <laughs> like, like, he's, he's, like, he's like, so Bane, you look so beautiful like some Michelangelo was going. It's like Lou Ferrigno. You're such a beautiful baby boy, Bane. But he's just never seen the lights because his dad's cheap. Makes him lift in the basement. Dad, Dad, Wayne's company, they doing a banquet hall at, at where we were going to do the bodybuilding competition, so they canceled it. And that's his backstory. <laughs> is that he lost to Arnold because when he was in his top shape, they had to cancel the bodybuilding competition. That would that would be cool if Wayne Industries, their actual business was club promotion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just handing out flyers. We came up with ladies' night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for that reason and many others, Thomas Wayne is definitely the closest thing to a antagonist or villain because and also the movie sort of introduces the idea into the uh, Batman universe that the Joker is the bastard son and half brother of Thomas Wayne. Now, but that's movie, not clear. It brings it Very back. Very Freudian. The, the movie brings it back and like implies that like uh, his mother who he like uncovers a letter which would imply that he is Thomas Wayne's uh, bastard child and that's why he's lived a hellish deprived existence as his father's sort of primordial uh, denial of his existence and responsibility for fatherhood. But then it sort of brings it back and implies that maybe his mother is just crazy as well and also the real source of his abuse and trauma mm -hmm. in his life. But It, it was supposed to be Alec Baldwin also. Is and it, then, so they got a guy that looked like Alec Baldwin to play Thomas Wayne. Mm. Yeah. And he would have played it like Trump. It would have been amazing. <laughs> You're a loser, Arthur. Bye bye. You're a clown. You're a clown. You're a clown. You get the clown out of here. He used like yeah. the inflection he used with like the greedy little pig message mm -hmm. on the like. Yeah, no, I mean, like, that That was, like, you know, again, like, but the biggest complaint you can have about this movie is, like, it's a bit on the nose. Um, but the, like, you know, you abandoned me kind of thing and, like, you know, you whatever exploited my mother either like literally or whatever like it's again it's a little on the nose but like you know you the you paternalistic wealthy people have abandoned your children yeah well, see that's the thing i think it has a, i think it has a uh allegorical sort of symbolic valence and that is that even if he isn't technically his half brother, in his mind he sees himself as the half brother of Bruce Wayne. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Bruce Wayne and Arthur represent socioeconomically the great divergence in like white uh, uh, the destruction of the white middle class after yeah. deindustrialization. What 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 I hate to quote him, but what um, Charles Murray calls the great divergence, right? Where the mass of mm -hmm. the what of the, like the non skilled <laughs> working also, class whites say, yeah. collapsed in their standard of living. And the knowledge economy whites in urban areas and suburbs, they went off. No, but, and but there's Bruce Wayne, and then there's our The industrialization like also greatly negatively affected black Americans, too. No, that's what I'm saying, yeah. is that okay. it's not a unique phenomenon. It's just it was experienced specifically He's, by this group this way. He's not a good but father. But it is a, to... it is a universal phenomenon. Mm. It's just that he doesn't experience it universally. He experiences it through these cultural baffles that take him away from recognizing that it is a universal phenomenon and towards the specific and the alienated. Mm. He's not a good father to Bruce Wayne in the movie either. I mean, mm -hmm. he essentially yeah. abandons him and leaves his son to wander around the edges of his property and be molested by a Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> he molested by clowns. <laughs> yeah. And then when he meets the man who sexually assaulted his son the day before, he's like, oh, you're that guy that came to my house? Yeah. Just, he's like, that's <laughs> weird. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're that guy that came to my house. You gave you? my son flowers? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you do that again, pal. I'm gonna be pretty fucking mad at it. <laughs> he also he also stuck his fingers in his son's mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. To make him do the smile. Face. And thankfully, yeah. Ricky Gervais as Alfred saved him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they made Alfred cool. Yeah. Did anyone uh, read the Eileen Jones thing? This isn't a review, but it was like a kind of like um, like historical retrospective on like moral panics around film. It's really good. It's incredibly good. Um, like, but last, like which ones? There's just one. I mean, like, uh, obviously, um, the, the um, Do the Right Thing and uh, on Shein Do the Andalou. Right Thing's a big one. And on, on Shein Andalou, which was like such a limp dick, where, because he was like, I'm going to incite riots, and people were just like golf clapping at it. Remember An Natural Born Killers? Yeah, Natural yeah, Born yeah. Killers yeah. caused a huge fight. And in fact, they, Oliver Stone ended up getting sued by John Grisham. Did you guys mm -hmm. remember this? Really? No. So there was a copy. What the, the media what called a them. A, there was a 
there was a boyfriend and girlfriend teens who went on a crime spree in like Alabama or Mississippi, uh, and the media and they killed a a like a grocery store clerk or something in a robbery, and the media said, oh, they were inspired by uh, natural born killers, and John Grisham was like family friends with the guy who died, and he initiated a lawsuit of Oliver Stone, like he claiming that he led money. to the death of his friend. Who is the greatest that's lawyer so in America? Stupid. Oh, it's terribly stupid. What but that's a fur- I mean, that's okay. some, that's well, where you take it to the furthest extreme. The article is just called Joker and the Long History of Movie Moral Panics. Um, and she said, moral panics about provocative films like Joker as old as cinema itself, but more often than not, they're proof of a film's merit and of a deeply anxious middle class, um, mm. which is like the perfect... The thing, again, the thing the, that they, they I know, it's like the Edison them. movie where everyone thought the train was going to run over. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking, I mean, it was very threatening. Speaking of anxiety of like the middle class and specifically the media class who made this into a story, the palpable disappointment that there was not some sort of shooting this weekend that's I just know, they pulsating off happen. these people. They're disgusting. They wanted so bad for somebody to shoot so that they could confirm everything they ever thought about trash dick mayo boys. Mm-hmm. And it didn't happen, and they're fucking pissed. I just want to read this one paragraph because it like really zeroes in on like why people are mad. And this is before the movie even came out. Uh, the furor surrounding the new Joker movie, movie started not from a disastrous screening but from an ultra-successful one. It got an eight-minute standing ovation at the Venice Film Festival and subsequently won the film's prestigious Golden Lion Award. Just for context, Golden Lion has gone to Rashomon, <laughs> Ivan's Childhood, <laughs> Battle of Algiers, <laughs> Vagabond, Au revoir les enfants, The Story of Chiju, Vera Drake, Brokeback Mountain, and Roma. And Love Guru. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> just hoping someone's having a good time somewhere. I like to think that Euro partiers at the Venice Film Festival did that voting, were trolling us, anticipating the moral and aesthetic freak out among American guardians of culture at the elevation of Joker to significant art film stagers. Standards. I picture them hooting so hard, wine spews out their noses. You know what? She's a million percent right that it was one. It was absolutely trolling. Yeah. But it was also true. Good. It was perfect. They got to troll America and also honor a film that I think is fucking brilliant. (laughs) It's of its time, certainly. It's It's the film of the moment. It's like if movies now are supposed to be these cultural reflectors, if that's the idea. Well, then do you have to love this movie because this movie actually is culturally relevant and insightful. In I a wish way we had that a most of the movies that get pl- uh, plaudits for like, yeah, this movie really takes it to toxic masculinity. Mm-hmm. Eh, horseshit. It's all fucking pandering garbage that just is it exists to elicit a head pat for people who can easily deconstruct its baby brained ideology. This is a fucking challenging movie that's willing to do the Verhoeven thing of embodying certain malignancies and even bad filmmaking tropes to make a greater point. Mm. I agree. You're talking about Love Guru? <laughs> 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 that, that, sh- that was hilarious. You see that? Yeah. He's like, I'm an Indian guy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, I'm like you, Randy, baby. I'm from India. <laughs> okay, so on the subject of Ken Loach. <laughs> Sorry, you should have invited us on this. <laughs> Y'all are I'm so smart, India, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Love Guru and Ken Loach. <laughs> no, just Ken Loach. Okay. On the subject of Ken Loach, though, I mean, when we're talking about, like, I don't know, American, like, mainstream American movies and, like, class conflict or whatever. Like, I mean, Joker, in terms of, like, art, as you were saying, is kind of bad, right? Right. But But, as Matt, you were saying, is kind of in a different tradition, which is that, um, I don't know, we don't have a Ken Loach in America, you know? know? So our, like, Hollywood blockbusters about class conflict are basically the Purge franchise. Yeah, (laughs) Batman movies, the Purge franchise, that recent movie, Ready or Not, yeah, and like, I don't that was know. pretty good. I like that. You know, that. I like all those movies, but they're, they are also all like, oh, the rich are literally hunting the poor with crossbows. Will mm-hmm. no one do anything? It's a little on the nose. Yeah. Well, yeah, it has to be because we don't have a, tra- as you right. say, we don't have a We're class film tradition. We can only like put it in an exploitative box, which is why I like Red or Not a lot, which is why I love the Purge franchise, and same, which I think this might be the apotheosis of that approach. The last Purge one was... Pretty kind of a little problematic. It ruled. They tried to make, they tried to make a black up. black purge. It was great. That one? Oh, it was fantastic. I saw it in theaters. I didn't it really had a pussy grabber purge. joke in yeah. it. No, the that first, movie that was ruled. the first purge. I the think. first purge, confusingly, the third purge is called the first purge. Is the best yeah. of the series. It is like a is black exploitation. It's like a black exploitation social realist like uh-huh. propaganda movie. It's yeah. great. I, I saw the first one and it's like, okay, there's one day where you can kill anybody. And I watch it. It was fun. It was fun. And then the second one is like, okay, Purge 2. So 
There's one day where you can kill anyone. They like add so, more exciting evolved, elements. It's each evolved time. out of like the premise. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I, so I at first it just... it's like, oh, the state's not here. You can kill everybody. By the second one, it's like the state is secretly engineering the yes. killing. Ah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, um, what happens mm. in the third one? I can't. The third that's the third actually one is the first one. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's they definitely show c- like a like a housing project. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, no, it's about because a woman is running for president to end the purge, and the, <laughs> and the evil Nazis who yeah. run the government yeah. hire a bunch of like uh, n- uh, like, like literal, literal like, KKK. like racist mercenaries yeah. led yeah. by. Uh, uh, There's false uh, flags. Do you think, do you think uh, in- uh, Anthony Michael Hall to kill her, assassinate her on purge night because they lift the restriction on political figures so that yeah. they can kill her. And it's all about how this revolutionary army wants to just kill all the evil Nazis who run the world. And she says, no, that makes us just like them. We have to win the election. <laughs> it's all about yeah. electoral Do you think reformism. In eight it's- years, we'll get an anti-war Punisher movie. But what's so <laughs> funny about that is that that movie is very reformist. But the first purge, the next one, is very revolutionary. It's Maoist practice. That's the first okay, purge. But, uh, but, but wait, wait a minute. What did you say? Well, we're going to get the an next anti- year is an anti-war Punisher. Well, that's the, what's so frustrating about that fucking Netflix Punisher is that Netflix Punisher was made by Hollywood woke people and they were handed an incredibly reactionary fucking thing. The Punisher is just right wing reaction from the 70s, from the from the Death Wish era. It is reactionary. Mm-hmm. And they tried to make him like woke and he's actually killing Nazis. And but he's like he's a guy who kills people pathologically. You have to try to do something like that. And instead they're like, no, we're gonna have our cake and eat it too. And it's totally incoherent and sucks. They need to embrace the Joker as a bad guy, the way this or the fucking Punisher is a bad guy, the way this movie does. Okay, but they should make a version of the Fantastic Four where they fight the national debt. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, On the anti-war tip, though, like I. When I was just reading these reviews, like just, you know, numbing my mind with like liberal moral panic idiocy, like one of the things people kept saying was just like, oh, so we're supposed to feel sorry for this person. Oh, so we're supposed to sympathize. At one point, someone says, oh, because people didn't love him enough. And it's like, he was like chained to a radiator and beaten really into so, brain damage. I felt as a really child. sorry for Arthur. Yes, Black. you're supposed to. Also, also, and it's because also, it's great, it doesn't yeah. cost anyone. But on the anti war thing, I realized. Liberals are now invoking something that we originally did with, I think, the um, the juvenile delinquency scare and then the war on uh, drugs and then the war on crime and then the war on terror, where anytime you were like, oh, shit, some people like hit some buildings with a plane. What are we? Oh, you know what? Maybe America's foreign policy might have something to do with that. And they're like, what are you sympathizing with the terrorists? It's like, Absolutely. do you want to solve these problems yeah, or not? Yeah, you want to patho- you want to like make blame him for responding to No, they want to be force. moralizing like yeah. fucking like judges and like it's like if you ever suggest like a pragmatic approach to something where it's like, oh, where do these people come from? They're like, look, some people are just monsters and our entire role is to condemn them. And you know what? Even if he might be bad, even if you're he's like- He's chained to a radiator. Well, yeah, but even if normal. you don't buy that, even if you think he's responsible for his actions and he's bad, so fucking what? Who decided at what point that you have to like and agree with the protagonist of a movie? Right. That they have to be a good or person? Anything. Or and their li- actions have to be justifiable? like Lolita? What is that child main bullshit? Yeah. And that is the basis for all of this. It's like, well, because the Joker is not like- uh, the bad guy in the movie. Mm-hmm. And he's the protagonist. I feel by like, definition or, you have to like him. Also, it and really start, everything he does is good. That really start. I feel like with with the fucking season finale or the series finale of Breaking Bad. I, all the criticism of that was like he should get his comeuppance. He should be punished. I mean, he died. He died, but it's like, you know, everyone was mad that, like, Skylar should get all the money and she should go to Jamaica to get her groove back and fucking <laughs> he should, his dick should fall off and he should be in jail. And it's like, what, just because they want entertainment to be Hayes, right. Co- Hayes Code era morality place. Yeah, it's like, how about this? Hayes how about, Code, you don't sell mass. Yeah. You don't fuck over your wife. No, no, because if I see the, the movie, show, it's going to make me asshole. do that. It's going to make me do it. If, the, yeah. if, I, if he looks cool, I'm going to want to do Again, these people believe they're like superstitious. They believe art is fucking witchcraft. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to Come Town, you'll have sex with your dad. Well, when I watch uh, porno pornographs, I want to have sex with uh, ladies. So <laughs> <laughs> I Got you there. About, I don't know what you guys are saying. We are over an hour, so I think we should offer our concluding thoughts on where does the Joker phenomenon uh, go from here, Felix? Um, we won't remember any of this shit. Like <laughs> probably like five days from now, there will be like a new thing, a new a new thing that everyone fucking argues about. Um, yeah, no, you you just just the rest of your life till you die. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say about the Joker and by extension, like the swirl of controversy and criticism that has been Mm -hmm. coming out is um, 
you guys know the literary critic Eve, Eve Sedgwick? She has this really great term, which is good dog, bad dog criticism, which is basically what everybody does now, which is to only evaluate a piece of art on how progressive it is or how reactionary it is. And um, I, you know, I think in terms of like Joker, like obviously I don't think it's reactionary, but I, you know, also don't want to just swing the other way on the pendulum and be like, it was so great because the politics were great. Right. So, right, because I like a lot of that reaction. Well, it was Death a movie Wish fun. is a Death Wish is a great. Yes, movie. but that's different. It well, it's not different when the, you're talking about a Joker movie. You know, it's like a comic book movie. <laughs> it should like the only metric you should be like weigh this film against is like what the filmmakers' stated intention or loosely is that like you can't have like you can't be funny anymore. And uh, what was the other thing he said? That's the only thing I've seen he Todd. Says, That's all he said. This is a, is, is, we live in a society, yeah. basically. He said this guy's yeah. in a hero. It's it's just like right, this is right. what happens to people when right. they get changed. I mean, you're really not supposed to like have to extract anything out of it other than like, let me sit here for two hours. And if this is like funny when it's supposed to be intense when it's supposed to be, then like, that's it. That's good. That, you know, I don't need anything more out of a Joker movie than that. We don't really need to be literal or didactic right. about the stuff. Yeah. I think my thing... Um, that like leaving this like I basically can't wait till a year from now uh, when people have to go back and watch this and explain why they were so scared. Yeah, seriously. Like that is the it's thing. It's like you're gonna it's gonna be like going back going to New Jersey and being like, hey, remember when you guys all thought War of the Worlds was happening <laughs> and you got muskets and put colonies around your head and formed a all, militia to fight off the aliens? My, all so much of my like uh, like sort of artistic satisfaction comes from patience and foresight at this point. Um, and I guess, like, I guess, like, the other thing is, it's just like, wow, people just really can't enjoy anything Nope, anymore. no, they can't. They're just, like, incapable of enjoying. Because like, everyone's too panicked about the fact that, that they only control culture. That scene with Gary culture. Glitter dancing, no, it's a great scene. Yeah, yeah it's cool. They, they, they pan they're just panicked. They're hitting the culture button because the power button is broken. It, uh, yep, that is a very good phrase. Yeah. I know uh, you're drunk, and that's why you said it, but let's remember it and no, make sure I, we keep I it I think in. it's true. Uh, so I have three final thoughts. Jesus no, Christ. Number one. Oh, can I have a question? Number one. Uh, speaking to, I'm glad this was brought up. I have talked a lot about how I love its themes and I think it's brilliant uh, uh, and it works on every level of metaphor. Uh, but I also want to insist that it is not only the reason I like it. I believe that when it comes to it as a film, it is well acted, great He's shots. Great. He's great. Uh, it, every, every joke lands. There are a handful of jokes everyone hits, which is uh, having a fucking thousand percent like ratio yeah. with w w and having them hit that well fantastic the violence is really gripping and 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 and, and gritty in yeah. a way that is grounding his character is compelling also i feel for him also rare i feel for him uh, I love all the performances. I love the way it ends. Uh, everything that happens, I'm clapping. When he kills his mom, I'm amazed. When the little <laughs> person is trying to get up, get out of the house and the fucking chain won't go, that's yeah. beautiful fucking physical comedy. Yeah. Right. So I think it's at that level gang. it works. And then the, and on top of that, the metaphors and everything are fantastic. That, that one shot where you know he says the thing about your son was killed in a drunk driving yeah. accident and how quick and like just, I mean, it's like a, a fraction of a second to get that timing right to cut to that bitch being like, you can't joke yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, like, it, don't you yeah, do yeah, that. It's so fucking funny. Point two. To, <laughs> to Felix's uh, argument that we'll forget about it in six months, I agree because nothing stays in the zeitgeist for that long. It's too moving too much. There's too much data. Uh, data. Uh, I do too much think people will get absorb. mad again when it wins a bunch of Oscars. Well, then it'll come back that when that happens. But and But I think that... That doesn't mean that it won't come back because the thing is, as you have pointed out a million times, time is a flat circle. Culturally, we, everything is just the same. Everything never really changes. So things go out of the cycle, but then they come back in. Some are embedded because of the import. I think the Joker is so freighted now with cultural import as a concept, and this movie is such a good job of bringing a lot of those things to the fore that it will be bow embedded and come back. And it'll go away, but I think it'll come back. So that's my, th my, my guess about it. And then third, last point. I think that the importance of the Joker character, the the his, his usefulness as a metaphor in the contemporary moment, uh, uh, can be shown with a simple point, and that is that during the uh, Obama years, the Tea Party guys would go around with p posters of the Obama as the Heath Ledger Joker, oh, yeah. and it oh, would say yeah. like uh, it, that's it when would I first got interested in politics. Bottom. And 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 there and and Barack Obama embodied chaos and disorder and horror and the mm. destruction of the country. Now at pro-Trump rallies, they have pictures of Trump as the Joker, mm -hmm. and that transition from seeing 
the Joker is this force for chaos and evil embodied by Obama, and now Trump being the, the, the savior and also embodying all the Joker's traits, that shows you where the Joker does, where the, what the Joker's uh, like, uh, cultural expression and usefulness is. So that's it. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, real quick. Uh, my ex-boyfriend is at a Zizek talk. The first question in the Q&A was, what did he think of the Joker movie? <laughs> what did he, he say? He hadn't hey. seen it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. I do. Zizek doesn't like it, I'll be very disappointed. Um, He'll I, love it. I do, I, do, good taste. I do want to have a small retort to what Matt said about this being permanently better than You are a small dinner. retort. All right, you know what? I think childish is your podcasting <laughs> is fucking childish. I've never wanted to do this. I regret everything. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I feel like we're like in a cultural lost decade where nothing from this time will be reabsorbed into the cycle. Mm. It'll be forgotten for a, just a decade of products that were consumed for the exact time they were out and gone forever. Everything's such a fucking re- re- regurgitation and a reboot that everything is, all the references are to other things, just like mm-hmm. Joker is. Yes. But I guess that's mm-hmm. what I mean. Okay. What about Joker? I'm we'll sorry. Back. One he will more be different, thing. but he will cut back. One but more Joker thing. On eternal. that tip, I have to say, I was talking about this with Jen. Uh, like, when I think of what, and I, whatever, I wore my Iron Maiden shirt in tribute of this. When I think of what, you know, scared like the Tipper Gores, like the last major cultural moral panic, where, by the way, like, liberals and woke people did join with like conservative Christian right and the authorities to be like, by the way, if you listen to Prince, you're going to be a misogynist. Yeah, take down Twisted Sister. Yeah. Like, I have to say, though, like, what did they say keep your children away from? It was the Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead. It was like NWA and death metal. And these kids, these poor kids, they get a comic book movie. It's yeah. recycled. That's really true. And you know it's what? Recycled. I feel we like we had great art to be yeah. scared of. Great. This movie like this, does a suicide fine. bombing. Well, we had, we had so unreal there's never, when I was there's never going to be a best ever death metal band out of Denton about a Joker movie, you know? And that's the sacrifice they were willing to make to make this movie because yeah. it had to be a comic book movie to encapsulate the entire phenomenon. No, it's time. But the fact that it's a comic book movie will fix it in time and make it less relevant. And so you know what? I retract what I said. Joker will come back, but in a different form. Oh, yeah, well, but did the you Joker's see there's a lady eternal, Joker? Regardless. But I find well, like this, yeah, but, yeah. but right? I will yeah, say that the Joker. sacrifice this movie made is pure and beautiful, and it is a fucking martyr. F- Club final thoughts, Nick and Adam. I don't know. Go see the movie and then yeah, go back to tight. Googling Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> Who gives a shit about the Joker movie? Get back to work. <laughs> Keep posting about Epstein. Epstein ain't going away. Yeah, see the, see the Joker movie um, and, pay, and say thank you to uh, Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, check out Love Guru too. And yeah. check out Love Guru. <laughs> yeah. For a movie dealing with similar themes as Love Guru and the Joker, check out Two Guns. But like also just a, a bigger point, and I, I mentioned it earlier, don't forget that this is just a movie studio finding a way to make a fucking comic book movie for sixty million dollars mm. and to use its PR department to drum up controversy and then have like a smash success in its opening weekend. Yeah. It is also that. Always be doing materialism. It is also yeah, that. Just, it's a fucking, it's a fucking the the day, company that. making a movie that, and they found a way to like. Yeah, get, but it's good. And it's good. That's the thing. No, it's good. Worse, That's the thing. It's like good. I, even, even like I'm not Scorsese's saying, criticism of those Marvel movies. Where he says like, oh, they're like theme parks, and it's like, well, no, theme parks are fun. Yeah, <laughs> but the Marvel movies just are dog shit. They're yeah, not but fun. like, you Joker don't, you don't tight, have to though. not enjoy. I love roller coasters by right. like paying attention to like the political economy that produces. Right, right, right. Go to the movie, have some popcorn, have fun. It's I will not say a this though, deal. just about it the craft of it. Take a girl, you. try to hold her hand, mm-hmm. uh, ask Cut if the you can kiss. in the bottom of the popcorn. Put the hole. Say the woman next to you like, excuse me, I think our popcorns got switched. Can you reach to see? Is this your penis? My popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like your penis. I think our. T- can you just check? Can you just check? Well, can you just check what you about what you were gonna do? And just like wander around the theater. And just like, oh, excuse, uh, excuse me, ma'am. I. <laughs> you should. When you go to see this movie, you I'm should be having doing. a really bad day. <laughs> if we could just talk for a minute, and you I should- could smell your hair. No, yeah. When you see this movie, you should do the thing that you know you should do when you see any movie, and just like mm-hmm. talk about your life's problems when you buy your ticket. <laughs> Go right up to the ticket counter and just tell them what's going on. This mm-hmm. movie is absolutely just a cynical product of a profit-minded uh, content mill. Absolutely, yeah. It's but fun. it's just also it's just a miraculous coming it together. Landed. It's the way that like the thing swells out of the of, I don't uh, even the think, ooze. It's like it's just a random Phillips product of like bio, good of bioproduction. Sorry. It's just it's it's DNA going crazy. It's life finding a way, as Ian Malcolm would say. Yeah. Uh, but I will say this: 
I've watched every single Marvel movie, the vast majority of them in the theater. So I'm there. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm looking at the screen the whole time. And none, nothing I've seen in, what, 40 hours now of footage has held my interest and attention mm. as much as a f- the first couple of fucking minutes of mm-hmm. this movie. I think Donald said on Letterboxd he, he found himself caring what happened next. Yes. Which is a great yeah, review. Yeah. yeah. Movies. Now, I don't yeah. give a fuck when I watch those movies. I'm high or on a plane and farting. There were, there were maybe like <laughs> two. There was like a 15-minute window where that movie started to drag. But other than that, it was great the yeah. entire fucking time. We need to wrap up the Joker Symposium. I think the uh, generally says be the consensus view. Uh, the Joker not going away, even though Hollywood continues to be a you know uh, a, a cycle of uh, repetition and self cannibalization. However, at this one turn around the wheel, the stars aligned to make something that was somewhat like somewhat uniquely perceptive about the Joker phenomenon and like just general cultural relevance of this like 1930s oddball comic character that continues to uh you know bedevil the public conscience uh through you know largely an uncannily good performance by joaquin phoenix but yeah. also wittingly or not some wittingly or not some fairly perceptive and smart uh writing and directing I want to pose one question oh for christ's sake just, no i want to pose one question this is just, more of a comment than a question it, it, Matt is, Christman? it is a rhetorical question it does not mean to go on just think about it guys imagine a world where the character that the Joker is in our world, this symbol of darkness, this twisted menace, this incredibly challenging role for any actor to take because of the darkness within it. Instead of the Joker, it was the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> <laughs> and like it's it, and, and like fucking Joaquin spent six months thinking up like uh, Halloween themed puns. How amazing <laughs> that would be. That's the world I want to live in. I, yeah. No. Once people see the monster mash scene, <laughs> like, mass shootings. Folks, uh, continue, continue to be twisted.